We ended, um, how old was your sister when she did her genealogy research to see if she could find her parents, her, her biological parents? So, I want to say when we were, I was 14, 15, we had gone back to the adoption agency and both of us were adopted to the same agency. Um, I was adopted in Dallas. Um, I want to say she was adopted in San Antonio. Um, but so through the same adoption agency, we had gone back and were given some information. Just no details. Just So the information I had learned was like my mother was 21, my father was 22. Um, he was 5'10", she was 5'4", wore size 7 shoes, you know, and blue eye, and just, just that kind of information. You know, she played sports in school, he played, he was football. Um, that was the brief information we both received about her. But then they gave us the opportunity to pursue it, and she took the opportunity and they hired hired private investigator and tracked down. So she she learned early on who her mother was. Um, her birth father was German, and he had gone back to Germany before her mother found out she was pregnant. Oh, really? And she had no way of contact. So her father doesn't know she exists, really and truly. Um, so I didn't pursue it um, till later on. My sister gave me a 23 and me. For Christmas, she had done it to find out more, you know, a little more about her, I guess. And uh, so I took the took the twenty three and me. Got started getting some information, but it was like generic stuff. You know, it's like most social media accounts. When you first get on it, you're you're on it every day, every second. You know, looking for stuff. And that was how I was with it. Um, then come to find out, you know, it was just like not finding out anything, not finding out. Anything. So it went from every day, every other day, to once a week, once a month. <laughs> and then my uh, half-sister pops up, and she actually messaged me. So, really? Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> You've recently met everybody, or, or it's been a oh, couple yeah. of years yep. now yep. since you met everybody. Uh, now, does your, has your sister met her mom? So my, my sister has, and her sis, her mother hadn't told her family yet really? that she existed. So that was kind of a, I think it hurt my sister some, you know, because we grew up and you, so we grew up knowing we were adopted from the beginning, you know, we just always knew we were adopted. Mm -hmm. And so when you hunt and search for you, you know, it's kind of like something's missing to a point, but it's like you lost something, but you can't find it. But right. it doesn't, what you lost doesn't change your life. You just, it's something missing. And uh, so I think that hurt my sister a little bit. So they had, they had a, had a relationship and, you know, growing up in Africa, we're coming back to the U.S. It's, when you get ready to go back, you're packing, you're buying supplies to last you for so long and you busy you know and my my sister's birth mother wanted to come and, and visit before she left and my sister said I don't have time and I think it probably hurt my birth mother or her birth mother but I know my sister didn't mean it the way it probably got taken you know, so when you growing up overseas it's just you're used to stuff that's normal for us that's not normal for somebody else. Right. So to say that, I think she probably took it as she didn't have time for her. Not that I'm busy packing and buying and trying to get everything ready to go back overseas. Not that exactly. I don't have time for you. I just don't have time right now. And so, you know, I don't know where they're at right now, their relationship. I know they still write or try to keep in touch. But so how often do you have contact with your family? There again, 
even mine, it's, it's, it's tough because I didn't find my birth mother, really, I was 50 years old. Right. So I have my life. Exactly. You know? She has her life. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's really, you know, when I think, I, I think about them daily. You know, my um, found out I, my birth mother, my half-sister, and I have a half-brother. And that's just on my mom's side. I have no information about my father's side yet. Um, may, may not, ever. So I may have more half sisters and brothers, just don't know. But so with Facebook, you see when people post stuff, you see everything that have, they're doing, and so right. it, it it takes away from that one on one contact anymore. So you feel like, oh, I, they they were out at the beach yesterday. I don't need to call them and see what they were doing. <laughs> so you. Yeah. It, it, so social media hurts relationships to a degree, um, because you see what they're doing, you don't know what they're doing. Right. So I, I and I get in that boat, and I'm, I stay, I stay busy, but I, I'll say I'm going to call. I need to call, and then two weeks later, I still haven't called. So you know, I try to make myself do it. When I when I start thinking about it, I try to make myself call. Just to say, hey, how are you? Wow, that's good. That's good. I, I, you and I met <clears throat> through the companies we both still work for. It's been <laughs> several years ago. And um, you know, some people, when you meet them, I mean, it's just like it's, you feel like you've known somebody your whole life. I, I keep looking in that light, dude, and it's just, I keep seeing stars. <laughs> I want to talk to Chad about that. So, full of real live podcast here, people. So, just, um, and, and, you know, and I feel the same way, you know, about Ken, uh, who works there as well. And I've got family strung out all over the place. And there comes a point where your family, it, it, Probably the easiest way for me to to, do, to explain it is when we first moved to Charlotte from West Virginia, we're like, oh, we're moving to Charlotte, you know. So, but my aunt and uncle lived here in Mid Hill at the time, and we were staying with them while our house was being built. And Dan and my uncle Dan said, John, you don't live in Charlotte. You live in your neighborhood. You live in your community. He said, we live here in Mid Hill, Matthews. We don't. We may go up to town and work periodically, but we live in our community. And your family can be the same way. Once you once you build friendships, once you move into a place and you you know your neighbors, your you know what your surroundings become more of your community almost than your family is that are that are that is at a distance. I mean, I've got family in Texas, I've got family in South Carolina and West Virginia. Our Son and daughter and grandkids are in Germany. You know, Chad uh, is in Virginia. So your community is what you make it. Your family is what you make it. And your story to me, to be raised in Africa, and, and have the friends. I mean, it's just amazing that you had to stand out like a sore thumb in Africa playing with those kids, but nobody saw your color. Those kids didn't care what color you were. You didn't care what color they were. It didn't matter. So what changes? You know, when we, when we grow, we get older, and it seems like all that has to change. You know, that's just like Little League Baseball or football. Parents are fighting in the parking lot over the game, and the kids are over here playing together. Come on. We need to, we can learn a little something from our kids here. Coming home yesterday, I hadn't done this forever. Uh, got frustrated on the road because I had, uh, with my position change, man, it's just taking so much stress off me, it's not even funny. 
So I'm not in as big a hurry. Uh, I, I, you know, I just don't let things aggravate me that much. But yesterday was, was a really tough day. Uh, it was really busy. Didn't have time to eat or anything. And I was just ready to go home and let myself get frustrated. But you and your wife, I'm going to change directions now. So you and your wife are now, you're doing sound, uh, the assembly up here, right? Multiply church. Multiply church. And there are assemblies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, that's where we pastor those assemblies. Um, that's a long story. They're not all the way where I came out of. But it, it, oh, that's changed. That's a story off <laughs> podcast. Some of these books that I have up around, and I'll have more up here. I, I, a lot of them I do, they're the Robertson family. And when, when Duck Dynasty first came out, the first episode I ever watched was the one where Willie had got that big order and, and, and Jace and Martin and Mountain Man and Godwin and they and Cy, they went out and they made that that conveyor belt thing. And I'm like, you know what? I hate to say this. I'm like, I'm not. This, I'm, this insults my intelligence. I wasn't watching it anymore for years. Then I st- later on in life, I started watching. And I'm like, you know what? This reminds me of my family back home. These people are genuine. Then I come to find out that Willie, Jace, uh, Willie and Corey, Jace and Missy, uh, 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 Jeff and his wife, uh, I'll think of it in a minute, um, have all adopted kids. And on top of that, then you have, I remember when I read Jace and Missy's book <clears throat> about their daughter and when she was born with a cleft lip, you see how real people are. And I can say all that to come back to when when I met you and I heard that your story, you know, about you being raised on the mission field, you were adopted and then, you know, finding your, your, your biological family. It just took me back to these people. Well, Zach and his wife, he is the nephew of Phil. Um, uh, It's it's, it's, uh, William's cousin. They adopted a newborn baby that they almost lost at birth. I mean, I mean, there it's. So when I look at you, and I look at these guys, these other kids that they've adopted, and I'm thinking, one day, maybe those kids, those same kids, because somebody took them and raised them right and taught them and, and loved them and raised them, that they're going, that maybe they'll get that phone call and meet their biological family and find out that, you know, it was circumstances that were beyond control. That they did it for the best of the child. That it wasn't anything that was, because if they wanted to be selfish about it, you would have never been born. You'd have been lost in an abortion clinic somewhere. So my hat is off to your biological mother for allowing, even though she she couldn't do it at the time. Now I'm getting emotional. Um, that but she. I'm going to tell you something, bro. There are people who stay with their biological families that don't have what you had, the love that you got in an adopted family, and what those kids are getting. And um, to me, it's amazing. It, 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 it really is. And I, I treasure your friendship and your story. And it, to me, it's an honor to be able to sit here and talk to you about it. So I wanted, <clears throat> now, I don't know how I got off on that rabbit trail. <laughs> That's why I got to have notes. 
at what point, at what age, did you feel or pushed you or thrusted you towards the culinary side of things? It's just one of those things I've kind of always been able to do. Um, I know, like I said, my mom cooked everything from scratch. I complained about dinner one night. <laughs> and for whatever reason, she told me that if I didn't like it, I could cook for the family. And she told me what day it was going to be and said, we'll take you to the grocery store. You can get whatever you want to fix, but you're going to fix for all of us. And I did. And she said, if we don't like it, we're going to complain about it. And they didn't complain about it. But, and then, so at 16, when you move away from home, there is no, and growing up the way I did, there is no mama's cooking anymore. You know, there is no going home on the weekend and, like, you're in college and getting mama's cooking again. It was, so it would be six months in between. So the first year, I think, when I was at Fork Union, I went home during that school year that summer, and that was it. So for that whole year, I was in the U.S. with without mom and dad. Um, so, you know, it was, so as I grew older, I had learned how to cook, you know, if I wanted it, I had to cook it. There was no going and finding it from anybody else because there was no other family for me that cooked like my mom, you know, so I had to learn how to cook. Were there spices that are pretty much, you know, in Africa, it's, it's, it's uh, how do I say it? That's culturally theirs, or is it mostly salt and pepper type thing? Or there in Zambia, not everybody, especially when you get out to the rural areas, have access to spices. So it is salt, pepper, onions, tomatoes. Um, You're making my mouth water now. Hot pepper. You know they they grow hot peppers. So oh really? Piri piri. But it's you know so they have that, and that's that's. That's the majority of what they have. So that's what they cook with. Now, is the majority of their bread leavened or unleavened? That's, you know what I mean? Un, because they they do a lot of it sometimes on the open fire. And, oh, and, man, you know, so. talking me. Now I'm really slobbered <laughs> over here now. Wow. I, 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 I'm amazed. So you also learned how to butcher over there, right? Because y'all butchered your own meat. We did. Uh, so on the farm, the uh, the other family and us would get together. We would get a hog or a half half a side of beef, and would butcher it. You know, I don't remember what cuts were what. I just remember they would put stuff there and tell me what size to cut it, cut up the fat, take it off, or whatever. You know, and so I did that. You know, nine years old, or I was exposed to that. That's made our own sausage, you know, so that was one of the things we we ground our own sausage with a hand grinder after we, you know, cut up the pig. So, what did you think the first time you ate sausage out of the store? Very bland. <laughs> <laughs> there's, that, no, there's nothing like the old, because my grandfather uh, used to butcher hogs before he left home. Uh, long story, but anyway... Then my grand, my dad's mother, they used to have homemade sausage made with sage. It was just, uh, pretty much salt, pepper, and sage. That's all it was. Best stuff ever was. And I just, I've never been able to replicate that. Or, and I've tried to make sausage before, but I've never been able to get that taste again. So, yeah, oh, that's, I'm, I'm not a sausage guy. I really am not, and that may be because I ate so much of it growing up. It was always sausage and eggs for breakfast, not not so much bacon, but sausage. Um, so I, I don't eat sausage a lot anymore. I can relate to your cooking story, but mine's different. 
by your mom. Did you say you didn't like something? So my stepmother, here I was. Now, when you're a teenager, you know everything, right? Yeah. Especially just entering into puberty. So we had moved into the country out of the city, and uh, my stepmom, which basically raised me, said something to me. We got into it over something. I looked at her and said, you're not my mom anyway. She said, okay, big boy. <laughs> she said, she didn't get, she didn't yell at me. She didn't scream. She said, okay, big boy, from this day forward, you'll do your own laundry. You'll cook your own meals except for what I cook for your dad. And I did from that day forward. And ever since then, I was 14, 13, 14 years old. Best thing ever happened to me, dude. And I'd be like, oh, what if she made you do your own laundry? Yeah, I had to cook for myself. And here's the thing. You go ask Abby. You ask my wife today. There was times that, that whenever uh, uh, my dad's stepmom would be gone, and I would actually cook a meal at the house and go pick her up and bring her back, and I would have it all there. And all out on the table, whole nine yards. I didn't have money to go out and eat, brother. And Dad usually bought a hind quarter of beef, so uh, I would have that there. All right, real world podcast. Chase, don't take this out. Everybody needs to know that this, we are a real world here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, ladies. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are really, we are really shooting a podcast here. So it's so nice outside. I had the windows open. Forgot to close that one. <clears throat> and the uh, my neighbor decided to mow his grass. Wow, I, I just I don't really know where to to even go to next. But anyway, yeah. So that day, since that day, I, I you know uh, then when we got married. Uh, Evie saw, me, saw how I did laundry. <laughs> she said, you do your own. <laughs> they don't, don't ever do my laundry again. She, because I would put stuff in the dryer that well, shouldn't be in the dryer. What well, should have come out this big, come out that big. And, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that's amazing. So there's... Um, so what did you do when you left the golf course? Building golf courses. So there, we, I, for that company, we did so many things. I harvested pine cones. Um, what did you do with pine cones? <laughs> so to get saplings, in order to get saplings, you got to harvest a pine cone before the pine cones open up and lose all their seed. Oh. So we, for Georgia Pacific and Warehouser, we would go into the orchard and harvest the pine cones while they were still green but turning brown so then they would we would pick the pick the pine cones off the tree with bucket trucks and gather them on the ground and bag them up and they would in turn set them through an oven and i guess a shaker so once they went through the oven that the pine cones would open and then it would shake the seed loose that way they could get get the seed Hey, so how many seeds is there? Is there, is there only one in no, a... No, there's more. In every little, like, finger little thing that op on a pine cone, there's a seed under, you know, underneath of that. So, so I wonder if the ones that we buy, like, at Lowe's or Home Depot that's got the cinnamon all over or whatever that we buy that are scented, or if that's where those come from or if those are just harvested. Those are there. probably harvested naturally. Cause <laughs> the, the ones we were picking, they were small. Smaller. Yeah, about, you know, two inches around, maybe. Yeah. So they hadn't fully grown. That's amazing. So so I did that. Um, we built golf courses. Did So I built, uh, I actually built the, all the, put in all these sand traps on the very first Valentine course in Valentine. So that was one of my jobs. Glen Eagle, or not Glen Eagle, but... Uh... Valentine Country Club. Really? Yes. That was back uh, when 
there was no 521 through there. You had to go into downtown Pineville and. That's exactly where I'm talking about, actually, is, so, is that but there's a neighborhood I used to paint in that actually backs up into it. Yeah, I built the first course, put all the sand traps in on that course. Wow. So, um, so that, um, we would... Uh, so anybody plays golf there that, you know, uh, and you don't like the sand traps, this is a guy. Right? <laughs> so, um, got good at it. I, you know, so being an artist... I had an eye for the way things should flow somewhat, so I was able to change some things that they didn't originally design, but it just flowed better. So I did that and never, never got in trouble for it. So um, the, the company also, we would clear. So if a new neighborhood was going in and there was trees, um, we would go in and clear for the right of way. Um, for where the roads were coming in. Um, so that's how I started learning how to run equipment. This is where all this came in. Um, this same company um, owned a campground off on Lake Norman. And so before I started to learn how to run the equipment, I was the maintenance man in the campground. So I learned how to fix water lines and do some sewer work and things like that. And, the equipment would come in for maintenance. I'd do oil changes, and if I need, we needed a bigger piece of equipment. You know, I kind of started learning how to run the equipment. And I went, I went home on vacation, and I told the boss when I came back, I didn't want to do, be the maintenance man anymore. I wanted to learn how to run the equipment. And so, sure enough, when I came back, he put me to doing that. But I was a chainsaw man. <laughs> so we'd go clear. I got a piece of equipment for you. <laughs> So we cleared the trees, we logged everything, just it, it saved money, it was extra money for us as the company, so we logged everything we cleared as much as possible, and so I was learned how to run the chainsaw. Um, and in doing so, started running the equipment more, um, and then I got to start, I started running equipment. I wasn't the chainsaw man anymore. Um, and that just kind of broadened into other things, and then... So after I learned how to run equipment, I decided I needed to learn how to do something else with the equipment and knock down trees. And uh, so I just kind of gradually jumped from company to company and learned different aspects of construction. Um, so I have gone from clearing the land for the road to go in to clearing and grading the lot for the house to sit on to also building the road, putting in the water, putting in the sewer for the housing. Yeah. Wow. And before that, before I even got into all that, I used to dye paper for a company that made paper ribbon. So I have a very broad background. In. Well, here's the here. Well, and not only that, but here to me, this is the great thing about this. If you ever decide you want to stop doing cheesecakes, you can always turn that that truck into a handyman truck. I could. And just go do maintenance work, handyman stuff for everybody. You probably make as much or more money you're making with cheesecakes. And that's, that's, uh, but I, I've heard that you, that you're one of the, well, we know Ken said it, but said that you were one of the best equipment operators he's ever been around. I mean, he, he paid you a great compliment that, that he said that, uh, said you were awesome. Well, when I first got into running the equipment, the guy that taught me how to run it, he said, I can't. He actually told me, he said, I can't teach you how to run the equipment. He said, I can teach you what each lever does. You will have to figure out your own way of doing things. Because that is how you operate. And that's true. So, he, and then... Me and him worked together for, for a couple of years, and he actually came to me, and he told me, he said, you know, I have been operating equipment for close to 30 years, but you taught me something the other day. He said, I watched the way you were doing something, and I tried it. He said it was easier than the way I've been doing it. So that that is something I've carried with me. So when I, when I talk to people and teach people how to operate equipment, I don't... I don't teach them how to really operate. I teach them what the levers do. 
give them some pointers on things to try. You know, so it becomes your style, you know, your way of doing things. If it's easier for you to do it a certain way, do it that way. Right. You know, it's as long as you get the end result, as long as it's safe, of course. You know, but that's the thing. So everybody has to learn something on their own. You can only teach so much. Exactly. And that's, you know, and, and you, what you're saying is, is very, very true. It's no different than a car. I mean, you, you show somebody where the steering wheel is, the, you know, the, how to put it in drive and where the brake is or the clutch. And uh, then they're the way, that's why everybody drives differently. Everybody has a, their own style of operating a motor vehicle and it's no different. <clears throat> so we had, when I worked for my uncle underground or in the coal mine, there's a wear plate on the bottom of the tracks about two inches thick and, there, and that was just so that when the tracks were going around it didn't wear in it was just a wear plate so that it so a continuous miner that has the river heads on it they're the ones that's what's doing the work but what this guy would do is he would jam those river heads into the face and he just had the tracks just continue to grind instead of easing it into the face and letting the, and letting the ripper head do the work he's trying to force in it's sort of like taking a saw <clears throat> and instead of letting the saw blade go a little slower and let it do the work as you're pushing through it you're just trying to, and you're bogging it down and that's what, and he just I mean he just hard on that they just wore the equipment out and you, it's not hard to tell when when you have somebody that knows how to operate a piece of equipment and somebody knows just how to run a piece of equipment, there's a difference. You you can you might be able to run it, but can you operate it? It's like I tell people sometimes, or, or I tell people, or tell my wife when I, when I get aggravated with somebody, I'll say, you know what? I don't want them to just hear me. I want them to listen to me, or, or one way or the other. Don't just listen to me, but hear me. Hear what I'm getting. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Don't just sit there and look at me and be thinking about something in law law. But you're you're absolutely right. And it's it is a gift. I mean, there's people my brother in law has that gift, like you. Well he went to uh, Clarksburg to the uh, power plant there. He'd operated equipment on a strip job for years. He can operate anything. And so when they got there, the guy was going to go out with him and show him how to do something. <laughs> so he showed him a few things, and then Shannon got on there, and he said, dude, I'm not even going to show you anything else. He, he just left. He said, just get it. And he's, Shannon's actually saved them tens of thousands of dollars <clears throat> showing them how to do something that they don't have to bring contractors in to do anymore. But he's, he's, he's the same way. Uh, I've, I've always wanted to operate heavy equipment. I guess that's what brings, you know, what would draw me to somebody like Matt's company if I, you know, if I'd want to go there. Even though I'm older, uh, learn how to operate a piece of equipment to me is really, <clears throat> really interesting. I mean, it's, I think if I got in a bulldozer or a loader or a grader or even a bobcat every day, I wouldn't go to work a day in my life. I, I just wouldn't. I'd never go to work. Well, that was like for me. So I, I, could, I could run, get on any piece of equipment I wanted to and run it. What I had to learn was what to do with it. So that was where, when I started in the construction field, I could run the equipment. I didn't know what to do with it. So that was, that was the, the learning side of running equipment, learning what to do with it. Because you know, each, you can do something different with the same piece of equipment. You just got to have the knowledge to do it. And do it safely. Yeah. And and to not wear your equipment out. Man, how do we go here from operating heavy equipment to <laughs> mixing up cheesecake? So for me, you know, life growing up, 
my family was very large, but my real family was really small. Um, and that brings me back. So when we met, not a lot of people that I work with know my story. Just a few. And I've learned, so like I said, growing up, every missionary family was an aunt and uncle. You know, we didn't call them anything. It was uncle this, uncle aunt this. You know, and so back to you when we met, Ken. So there's just, there's very few that know my story that I associate with outside of work just because too many people come and go. So in growing up the way we did, you learn quickly. You, you learn how to read people very quickly. So you choose, you can choose quickly who you start re- having a relationship with quickly. Right, I agree. And so I have that ability to read people. And so you know, that, that's where, when I get, when you get close with somebody, it lasts. So I have, I have friends through Facebook, thank goodness, that when I left in 1986, I haven't seen again. But I can talk to them today like it was we saw each other yesterday. So that's what it is with me with the military. There's a couple guys that I well, there's more than a couple, but there are a few people that I still kind of keep in touch with through Facebook. That I'm sure that if we would ever run into each other again, it'd be like we had, you know, it was just yesterday that we had met each other last or talked last. And, and I think that's one thing I'm happy about with social media, but at the same time, I feel like people use that as a crutch not to get together. And like you said earlier, there's a big difference between being there at the beach with somebody and just seeing it and hearing about it on Facebook. You know, there is. You're, you're connected, but you're disconnected, if that makes any sense at all. So... You have gone 360. I hope you don't care me tell you this. Jason bought a small farm. What I call a small farm. Like North Carolina's standard is probably a small farm. Five acres. It's no, it's no little thing. Um, and uh, I'm going to start calling them Green Acres now. Uh, call, it, call it the Green Acres. Uh, but, uh, but you said you have to mow four acres of that? You gonna push it? Nope. <laughs> I actually just looked at a lawnmower online that will cut 5.8 acres an hour. Is it uh, remote control? It's a zero turn. Really? <laughs> I'd hate to see the price on that job. Is that one of the dual wheel jobs? No, it was actually wasn't bad. It was five thousand five hundred. Oh, that's not bad. Zero turn. Some of the things are ten and twelve thousand dollars. Yeah, so I was shocked. So I'm in, I'm in the market, you know. That's one of the things about this being wintertime now. I don't have to cut grass. <laughs> took me, with my with my lawnmower that I had from our past, another house, to cut half the front yard. It took me two hours on a riding lawnmower at that. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I don't know. We're kind of the same way, or I am. And he says, I've never been able to make it anywhere without having people around me. But I miss being able to walk out my back door and, and rabbit hunt, uh, squirrel hunt like I did when I was growing up. Being able to walk outside and shoot my bow without having to worry about neighbors flipping out because, you know, oh, what's he doing? You know, not understanding. and peace, privacy. I don't care to have neighbors. Um, and I love my neighbors. Listen, I, I was just, the other day, I was just thanking God, man. Thank you so much for our neighbors. We have awesome neighbors. But I'm so being raised in West Virginia, man, I'm just the type I like the openness. I, I really, I do. 
maybe one of these days I'll be able to move out into the country a little bit and get an acre or two where I've got a little bit more. I can go shoot my bow or get a 22 or whatever. Just go shoot. Just just walk the woods with a gun on my hand. Beat. Once again, do that. Like I used to do as a kid. We actually had my, my daughter and her husband and my, both my granddaughters, my, um, my, my daughter had my other daughter's daughter, so with her yesterday, so they stopped by, I just, I just built the fire pit, um, Saturday, uh, Thursday, when we were off for Veterans Day, I actually built the fire pit, dug up, dug up the rock right there on the property, built a really nice big fire pit, so we actually sat around the fire pit last night, yesterday evening, kids ran around, had a light on the back, they, they ran around, tackled each other in the grass, and so we just sat and enjoyed the, the down, the kind of almost, not really quiet, but you have the traffic still, you hear it, but it was still, nobody peeking out the back window, you know, I mean, it was so, it's nice, nice being out there now. It, I'm, I'm sure it is, um, and you're like me, you know, you like your friends. But then you like to have your time away from everybody, too. I mean, that means a lot. <clears throat> and to have kids be able to come out and experience that, something that very few kids today get to experience because everybody's right on top of each other now. And that's... So, before we get out of here, I gotta, I'd got like to... A couple things I'd like to ask you. One, your mom and dad, do they ever travel back over to see your sister on the mission field? Because your, your sister is still on the mission field. She is. They, they're getting older. My dad's fixing to be 80. Oh, that's right. You said he's 80 years so old, so it's probably harder for him to travel. They, they have told her <laughs> that traveling is rough on them. It takes them longer to recuperate. So they're, they're probably have gone their last time already. Unless... We've, we've tried to talk about going back to Zambia, the family, my mom, dad, me, my sister. So the last time I was in Zambia was in 1994. Wow. And that was the fam The whole family was there. Um, so we discussed and talked about that. It's just COVID hit. You know, so that kind of just threw everything way on the back burner. You know, plus it's been so expensive to fly anywhere so we you know so if that happens they'll probably go but they, they might have gone their last time to africa i never thought about that when i asked you that my dad's he's 82 83 84 somewhere through there and just going to texas to see my sister before she passed wiped him out I mean, it just, it just totally wiped him out. Even for them to drive here and see us is rough. Uh, and I, that, that hurts me. But I know that, you know, they love to travel. They love to go and they love to see and love to do. But, man, when it gets hard on you, man, it's, it takes fun out of it. Yeah, so it's, you know, I can shoot. They live just outside of Birmingham, so I can shoot down there. Maybe six and a half hours. It, it takes them probably eight to get here just because they stop and, you know, <laughs> get out and stretch. But, you know, so it, even even the drive from Birmingham to, to here, you know, it, it, it's hard on them too. So. You know what I didn't realize about Birmingham? And I, I guess I paid closer attention to it when I drove about to Texas this last time, CD. There's a lot of country there, man. I mean, the Appalachian Mountains kind of go down into there. And uh, it reminded me a lot of home. Because you normally get there, it's dark, so I really don't get to see much. Because of the time when I leave and drive. But when I came back through there, it was daylight. And I'm like, man, this place is nice. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's big. But if you get on the, the, the bypass road, like they're, they're 485, whatever yep. that is, um, you can really see, like, man, that there's hills, there are rolls. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I'm like, this is a lot like home. And then, and I did the same thing when I went to Pennsylvania with uh, when Brian Wise went up there to see his mom and dad. Uh, we shared an apartment together while Abel's 
and Chad were living in Morgantown, her going to school. If she had uh, finals coming, she'd say, Joe, don't come home. Because <laughs> she knew that I was a distraction. I mean, she needed to study. And, uh, and Richie wasn't in any trouble. I mean, Richie was one of those kids you could take him anywhere. So uh, if she would ever say, look, I got a test finals coming up, or if I just didn't have the money to go home that weekend, Brian would say, hey, I'll pay the gas if you want to go up and take me up to see Dad. And, and uh, when I went up there, I was like, man, this place is awesome. And it's in Allentown. Um, and it's a part of Pennsylvania that to me was just, Words can't describe it. It's just beautiful, man. That part of the Appalachian Mountains are just, I'm not going to say Appalachian, or somebody's going to, it's Appalachian. Um, and you answered the other part. I was going to ask you about how often you got to see your mom and dad, because uh, I know they live there in Birmingham. Do you all FaceTime much, or? Uh. Are they into that sort of thing? Not, not so much. It's kind of weird for them. I, I bet it is for my dad. Um, we, I talk. We talk. You know, pretty regular. Um, my sister is actually going to be in country this December, and so we will probably try to shoot down there, and that way get to see her and my parents. It's been. Probably been a year already since I seen them last. So yeah, that's and there again. Kind of seems normal for me. <laughs> well, you know, they. My dad, you know, he lives in Winston. I don't get up there to see him as often as I should have, uh, as often as I probably could. Um, and you know, I always make every excuse in the world. I know there's going to come a day when I'm going to wish I hadn't. Uh, but how long were they on the? How long? How how many years did they spend on the mission field? Cause they stayed there after you got married and left, right? They they were there thirty years, easy. I, I'm trying I'm trying to remember when they finally retired. Yeah, they were 30 years. And see, people don't realize, you know, when you're a missionary, you're not just giving money. You have to cut. You're over there for so long that you have to come back to the States and you have to raise money. You go from church to church to church to try to get pledged money. Or the ones I've seen, that's the way they did it. Um, and I think, but they were with the uh, Southern Baptists, right? So they, I think they did theirs a little bit, a little differently. Yeah, yeah. So, it was, but so they did go church to church, but in raising money, it went to all the missionaries, not just them. So a little different. Um, my sister with her, she, they're, they're nonprofit. And so they raise all the money to support their nonprofit themselves. So when they come into town, back in country, I say, you know, they, they're trying to push money for that. You know, so they, they get busy. So, you know, I try to call, hey, when can I come see you? Oh, well, we got this this weekend, and we got this coming up. And we're, we're doing this, or we're doing that. And, you know, then sometimes when it's a free weekend and they don't have anything to do, we shoot down there. Well, we see each other for about an hour, two hours. You know, sometimes she stays, but her husband, you know, he's running doing errands, you know, just because they don't have the time. So. Right. A lot of times they're in country, it's not a vacation. It's actually a working trip. It is. Like you said, they're either, they're either coming back getting supplies or something that they needed or trying to raise money or for, you know, or yeah. it's family or there's usually something because what, how long the flight is that? 17 hours, 18 hours? Right at 18. So. And it's not like you just, I mean, it's, so it's not, and it's not a $5 plane flight either. No. And what people don't realize is, and I didn't know this till we had missionaries that we supported in Africa. And there are certain parts of Africa that their airports, the air traffic controlling is kind of sketchy. Am I correct? Something in that? Yeah, sense? where we were, not 
in Zambia, not it wasn't bad. Um, where they're they are, I don't think it's bad either. Um, so they don't. It's just it takes them to get to the airport like an hour. It's just not easy, and it's not you're not on four eighty five or eighty five or yeah. seventy seven. So. Or like you said, you may have to go north eighty miles to just to go this way, and others. Five miles or something, yeah. where if you could have went straight there as a bird flies, you'd been there in ten minutes. Yep. Now I'm just I'm exaggerating. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so what's new? Anything coming up with uh, Cremosa? No, not yet. Winter time. Winter time. Time to decompress. So I've asked Jason to to, to help me out here. Um, before my sister passed, my mom had passed down a, what's called a Milky Way cake. I don't know if that's trademarked. I'm sure it is. Milky Way is. But a Milky Way cake recipe. And I passed that along to Jason. I said, man, you got to help me try to perfect this thing or, you know, take a look at it, make one, see what you think. And uh, who knows, maybe you'd want to put it into a cheesecake or something. I mean, it's an awesome cake, man. And it, that would, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to do that to honor her. Yeah, uh, was why I passed that on to try to keep that going. Because anytime we had a family reunion or anything, she always made Milky Way cakes. And they, they're not cheap. But, and they're not, <laughs> listen, if you've got heart disease, don't eat this thing. It's got like four or five sticks of butter in it. I don't know how many Milky Way bars. Uh, it's just, and then you pour this fudge on top of it. I don't, I never did like the fudge on top of it because it's the type of fudge mom used to make. But if it had a different type of fudge, I'd probably eat it. But anyway, it, it was awesome. Hopefully this ain't the last time we get you in here. And, um, because I'd like to, I'd like to get together and talk a little more about current events. Or, I'm not giving up on getting Ken in here with us either. And uh, I would like to, you know, just let him see what this side is like. And, uh, you know, uh, I think he would enjoy it. Dude, thank you so much for taking your time and kind of awesome story. Thanks I, for having me. I'm just, I'm, we were just talking before we started shooting that uh, I've got a face for radio. Jason's got a voice for radio. And, uh. But anyway, everybody listen, we're so glad y'all could join us uh, on the Shelter Hole. Please go to locals or 400productions.locals.com. You can catch us there. You can catch me on Facebook. Uh, it's just John Garrett. Uh, I think on Instagram it's still John Shelter Hole Garrett or the Shelter Hole. Uh, on Facebook it may still be John Shelter Hole Garrett. I've tried to change that. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm just... Look for me. Just go to John Garrett on Facebook. Also, Chad has Impetus of the Minds that he's he's done a ton of recordings for. On the Fortitude side of things, I've got a recording we're shooting at noon today uh, with a lady, and uh, we've got we're shooting a new season of Fortitude. We're shooting for ten episodes, and I think we've got three that are actually scheduled, and I've got another three that I'm working on getting scheduled. And actually four. So we're, we can have it wrapped up pretty quick. And uh, so anyway, thank you for joining the show. Jason, thanks for being here. Thanks we'll for see you me. in the next one.